Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's episode. We got a special guest for you guys. He was born December 21st, 1989, out of Mosinee, Wisconsin. Played one season for the Green Bay Gamblers, two for the Sioux City Musketeers in the USHL, and then four seasons for the University of Wisconsin Badgers. Defenseman, left-handed, Chase Drake. There goes that man's jock strap. <laughs> oh my God, did you see that? <laughs> America's team? Yeah, right. Oh, baby, it's a big day in sports. There's nothing like battling it out with your teammates all season long to go win a championship. Green Bay's got it this year. Huge move for him. I think it's going to be a game changer. We have a lot to talk about this busy week in the sports world. Welcome to the In a League of Their Own podcast. How's it going, buddy? Hey, it's going well. Thanks for having me on. I'm uh, looking forward to uh, chatting with you guys. I've uh, had the opportunity to listen to a few of your episodes and just super excited. So thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem, dude. It's always good to catch up and uh, it's good to have, especially you for the first interview. So it's good to grease the wheels here and get her going. Yeah, I, I appreciate it because there's no standard for, uh, for a guest or anything. So I can set the bar low or set it high <laughs> for you guys. No, and I'm glad before when we were chatting yesterday, you're like, oh, I got to get feel for the episode if I could swear. And you said it took you like a minute to figure out, oh, I'm good to go. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to fit right in. <laughs> so uh, do you want to just dive into a little bit about your background? Where you're from growing up? How'd you get involved in the game of hockey? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, like you said, originally from Mosinee, Wisconsin, grew up there my whole life. Um, you know, hockey is a very big tradition there in that community being a small town and my family was, I'd say a pretty large part of it early on um, in developing and, and having success. So um, my uncles actually played and uh, got into it with my best friend, Leroy Pekka. My, my dad never played hockey or anything along those lines. So we grew up going to dessert park um, probably at like age three, just kind of skating around and using the chair. Um, and then through his lineage and, and his dad still playing um, started obviously organized hockey. And then, um, from four till 18 stayed in Mosinee, um, worked my way all the way up through the ranks, um, you know, all the way till high school and played varsity hockey all four years there. Um, and, uh, really had an opportunity just to continue playing hockey due to team Wisconsin. So, um, you know, that was a big opportunity back then. They had two age groups, a 16 and the 18 team, and actually didn't make it till my 18 year. So my senior season. Um, and it was just a bizarre, like turn of events. So I played football and baseball along with hockey during, you know, basically all throughout growing up and did it through, through high school as well. So I would play football games Friday night. Um, luckily I was a quarterback, so I, you know, I didn't take too much beating or anything. And then we drive over to the cities Saturday morning or Friday night, depending and play elite league games. So Um, That was kind of my lifestyle for the fall up leading up until high school. Um, But that's really where I got a lot of notoriety. And um, that kind of led me to the path of um, learning more and playing after high school. Um, You know, back then, I I don't know if you knew a lot about juniors, but I didn't. I didn't know what the next steps were. I didn't know much about really anything after high school hockey, Um, as naive as that sounds, but nor did my parents. So, um, through that process uh, of Team Wisconsin high school hockey, was very fortunate to talk to, I, I couldn't tell you anymore, maybe like 40 Division One schools um, and had, you know, just as many offers. And, um, you know, it was it was an exciting period. We had NHL teams come to Mosinee, NHL um, scouts, NHL GMs. So it was, it was a great time to be 18 and in high school and experiencing that. Um, and then that led me to, accepting a scholarship at Wisconsin um, and then playing two years. Like you said, I, right after high school, I went to green Bay um, and then was traded the next year to Sioux city. And the plan was to play two years after did that. And then uh, was very, very uh, lucky to go in in 2010, the year after they had a national championship uh, runner up team. So got to be around all those guys like McDonough, step on Brendan Smith. I mean, just the, the pedigree of those guys and the success. So, um, yeah, and then uh, four years, actually five years later after I graduated, um, yeah, that was it. That was the run, and it was uh, super exciting. So, yeah, that's that's an amazing story coming from the small city, especially like in Wisconsin. Like you said, 
growing up, many people don't really know about the hockey after high school. I mean, in Canada, I, th I believe that they know that from the time that they're six years old that they got the OHL, and that's kind of the NHL for them to go to the NHL. So you playing juniors, was that decided by yourself through Team Wisconsin, or was that something that was worked out with, like, the University of Wisconsin saying, like, hey, you're going to go do this before we're going to bring you in type of deal? Yeah, so um, when all this was happening that senior season, I um, – I had a, a family advisor at the time, uh, Dean Grill through O2K Sports. So they, they deal with like Oshi and a bunch of big name guys in the NHL. And um, they kind of direct me in that path and would reach out to teams or whatever. And, um, and as soon as I accepted the scholarship from Wisconsin, they laid out the path for me and said, hey, this is the year you're going to come in. Um, it was a weird dynamic too. When I ended up playing in Green Bay, I played 10 games there. So they had a rule. Um, if you play 10, 10 games, you were the team's property at that point. So I, you know, you couldn't enter the draft or go anywhere else. So that was the plan was to stay there for two years. Um, John Cooper came in and was the head coach and then actually traded me to Sioux City, which, um, yeah, obviously he's a very smart guy, right? He, he <laughs> just like up with the, with the yep. lighting. So, um, he obviously knows what he's doing and things of that nature. But uh, yeah, I mean, that was the plan. They came in and said, Hey, 2010, unless anyone leaves earlier or anything happens in the meantime, if you accelerate, great, we'll bring you in. But um, I'm glad it worked out. I was 21 or 20 year old freshman coming in. So was able to gain a little bit of experience um, maturity wise, strength wise. Um, and then, you know, it, it took me a little bit to crack the lineup too. It was a little different, but yeah, that was the plan. Yeah, that's one thing I've, I've talked about multiple times on the podcast here, especially since like Colin hasn't played hockey and that type of thing here, trying to just like explain to all the people who don't understand hockey, how it's not Crosby doing what he did straight to the NHL out of high school. That's like, that's like insane where that happens. Like you need to grow up, you need to get that experience. And like, that's why teams heavily say, Hey, we at least want you to play one, two years of juniors, or we're going to put you in the East coast league or the AHL before we're going to pull you up to the NHL type of deal to just get your legs underneath you. I feel like that's really important. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, no, I would. I think, uh, so even kind of taking it to like a scientific level, they say hockey is the, the sport, for cognitive wise, the longest to develop. So, I mean, that's a big part of it. I see, uh, I apologize. It's my wife calling, um, <laughs> you guys can hear that. So, uh, but no, they say it's the longest cognitive time to develop. So you see, I don't know the exact percentage, but probably 80% of the kids do end up playing at least a year junior or two or three, whatever it is for that extra time to develop. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very common and very uncommon to see true freshmen come in, let alone playing at the professional level is it's like Kobe or LeBron. I mean, that's a really good analogy with those two. So. I guess just a question kind of going off that a couple of times on the podcast, we've talked about in some of these other leagues, like the NBA, the NFL, some guys who really have like a one and done college career, they get into the league, super young. A lot of them really younger than most of us. And you see them kind of fall through the cracks. Uh, they have early careers where, um, they get into drugs, alcohol, um, just about every, uh, almost every week we're talking about somebody who's killed somebody or domestic abuse. Um, I guess for the NHL, like one of the great things to see is there's not a lot of drama really off the ice. There's not a lot of st stuff like that, that happens and kind of, I guess, to elaborate on it more talking about like how it's common for people to go into juniors and these other lower leagues to, get that experience and establish themselves would you say that that kind of plays into I guess these guys having a good head on their shoulders before they get to that big league so that they know how to manage money and stay out of trouble yeah absolutely I mean you know this is my opportunity to plug right I'm a, so after after uh college I, I get you know graduated with a finance degree so I'm a financial advisor and you know that's the biggest thing you see is these young 18 to 20 year olds come in who never dealt with money and who really aren't mature enough when, you know, the money is a little different in hockey compared to those three sports. I mean, they're dealing with maybe three to four times what, you know, the first, first contract levels are for hockey guys, which makes a little bit of difference, but it's really the maturity thing on, on that side of it, where, 
you know, $5 million at 18, I don't know what I would have done. I probably would have blown it making some poor decisions. And, you know, you, you're, you have these standards of what your lifestyle should be. And, um, it, it really just falls on that maturity, at least in my opinion. So. Oh, absolutely. I would have went and got a car or went and bought a house. I would have, you know, 18 years old, you're in high school, pulling up to high school with a brand new Lambo or something like, wow. Yeah. But yeah, that's exactly why the NHL continues to over and over again, never, you never hear anything about anybody in the NHL. And I feel like that that's why they fly under the radar so much which it's glad to see how they got that ESPN deal back, how they're going to be back on ESPN. So that's going to bring definitely a lot more eyes on the game. And especially with how well everybody conducts themselves as professionals, like you never hear them say the word I, it's always we, us, like all the time. It's just so cool to see hockey grow from where it was when we were kids because you're only a few years older than me from like where we were kids to now here in the united states hockey is huge yeah i was on my way home yesterday and uh i'll randomly turn on um nhl radio and uh it was the prospects game the bio steel prospects game so they had the i believe it's the 18 development team versus the top ushl kids um, and they were talking about states to watch and, you know, obviously like the big ones are always Minnesota, Michigan, Massachusetts, but, uh, they were talking about Arizona. There's a line from Arizona that has three kids in California. So you're starting to see just an expansion of hockey throughout the country and, and all these hotspots. And, you know, it tends to be in NHL communities and past players kind of staying in those areas. Um, but it's not just your traditional states anymore. So yeah, it, it's definitely exciting to see it expand and um, become a lot more, uh, more feeling like a top four major sport than, you know, what it was in the past. So. So how was it that day that you signed that letter to schools paid for? I'm officially going to be a division one college hockey player. Like what goes through your head at that moment? Yeah, it was probably the most, I'd say, surreal moment that I've, I've ever maybe experienced in my life. I mean, like I said, you know, leading up to that point, it was never in my mind, maybe until I was 17, 18. Um, you know, we're now, nowadays kids and families, you know, they think that because you play and you play triple A or whatever, that you're going to make it. We didn't, I didn't have that thought till I was 17 or 18. So got to experience it in a really fast and um, accelerated moment, but I, I, I do remember it. I was there with my family and high school coach. And, um, you know, I, you know, growing up, my dad didn't know much about hockey. So um, it was just a feeling of just, like I said, just serenity where it was, it was amazing. I mean, um, one that I'll never forget. So. So who was, did, uh, did anybody from the Badgers come like up to Mosny or in like talk to you or anything or like, Who's the one, I guess, that got you in there? Was it Barry Alvarez, the athletic director? Like, who's in charge of that whole process? Yeah, so they they lean heavily on the assistant coaches um, to go out and recruit. I mean, outside of – so they'll be your first, basically, point of contact here. Um, and the final say is the head coach. So there's some type of, you know, pecking order that goes down. So when I first talked to – it would have been Kevin Patrick. He was the assistant um, at the time. And then it led to the D coach Osiki. And then, so they would come to elite games over in the cities. I mean, it's the, it's probably the most heavily recruited league in the world. Um, so they would come watch, you know, who, whomever. Right. Um, and then it led to Mosney. Last time I talked to them before heading down was at the state tournament. So talked to Patrick and Oz after the game, invited me down for a visit. And then, you know, you do your whole campus tour and all that good stuff. And then, uh, then you sit, you sit with the boss after that in his office and they kind of lay out the plan, what the money looks like. Um, you know, basically that's, that's about it. So. So obviously, as we stated, you went to uh, university of Madison, of Madison, you said that there was other D one offers, what kind of other schools were, I guess, in your order of if, Wisconsin didn't work out like what are the other schools were you considering going to yeah um you know being from Wisconsin and, and loving Wisconsin hockey I, I don't care if I, I'll tell you right now there's two I wouldn't have gone to and it was Minnesota and North Dakota like 
I don't care like how good they were or what the money was. I, I just wouldn't have gone. That's kind of my mentality in that rivalry. But um, uh, a lot of a lot of other WCHA schools. So you look at Mankato, Duluth, St. Cloud. Um, it would have been Denver at the time, CC. Basically every WCHA school. Um, and then you look into the uh, I forget the con- all the conferences have changed. Changed, yeah. yeah so the Michigan, Michigan. I mean basically there was like 40 out of the 60s so but looking back um the nice thing about it is I I was a fairly good student so I had the opportunity to um actually go and visit some Ivy League schools so I got to go and visit Princeton and Yale which were I mean that I hindsight I guess maybe that would have been the route um not knowing if I would have played pro hockey or not just to have an Ivy League education um that or Notre Dame those those were probably the three that I would have heavily considered outside of, um, Wisconsin. So. So then you end up at Wisconsin's your freshman year. Uh, you talked about having a hard time cracking the lineup. Walk us through that process of what goes into a freshman coming on campus and, and like being in the position that you were in of where you got to work to crack the lineup to get into play. Yeah, it was uh, really, really tough. I mean, I, I was kind of mentally prepared for it coming in um, because in high school, you know, more of a talented, you know, point kind of producing player um, and really just had to alter my game in junior hockey and focus on the defensive side. So I really took the onus in, in making sure that that style of game and that was my first order of business. Um, and then moving to college, right, you're playing 21, you know, maybe 18 to 25 year olds. So they're bigger, they're stronger, they're faster, you name it. Um, but it was a challenge. It, it was a tough, it was a tough year. I didn't play at all my first year. I actually redshirted. So um, it was really, really challenging mentally to stay engaged and involved um, and to see that the light at the end of the tunnel. And it took, you know, even into the next year, I, I only think I played two games and then it led to 20. And then the last two years I didn't miss a game. So um, you know, I had to reinstill a work ethic and a mental toughness in, in, I guess, myself and was fortunate to have a good supporting staff and family and friends and people that were encouraging and not to give up on the dream that, um, you know, I could have walked away from just because I wasn't playing or, or I could have transferred, right? I mean, that was another option. So, but uh, chose to stick it out. And I'm glad, like I said, we had some, played on some really, really good teams. Um, and, you know, I, was got got to be captain my last year there so that was probably my biggest accomplishment in the hockey world so for like just talking about kind of your process coming in freshman year and work putting in the the, the work and effort to eventually become a captain your senior year um as you talked about i never played hockey like growing up but just kind of it's a reference to think back to sports playing in like high school and even i did do d3 track at uh uwo so just kind of thinking of those moments was just like high pressure situations but obviously like track is more of a kind of under the radar sport as well and it's not a lot of attention on it so i didn't really have like cameras on me or interviews or anything like that so i guess what what did you have to do mentally and like wh- how did you prepare to once you're realize I made it to be able to continue to do that to do that night after night without getting too overwhelmed and either letting your school slip your performance slip and just kind of walk through that yeah so there's it it definitely took a while to have I mean the school to sport aspect is probably the biggest balancing act so especially after taking two years off to play junior hockey where I was out of school I lost my study habits really, you know, the will to, to learn, I guess, at that point. So it was kind of a shock to come back to that right away. Um, but, you know, like I said, it was, it was super nice to have a support staff where they had uh, advisors there that could help us pick classes certain times and they had tutors. So that, that portion of it was, you know, taking care of itself. Um, but on top of it, I mean, not being, able to be in the lineup every night or play a game, I mean, was, was grueling. And really, like I said, just had to lean on family and friends in order to, to kind of get through it. Um, but also put the onus on yourself. I mean, like you said, it's, I made it, but now that's really when the work began, um, for me and maybe, you know, looking back, I probably waited two years too long to start that work should have started right away after I committed. But again, I was happy to be there in the moment and 
maybe took it for granted for a little bit. So it, it you know, it takes maybe a slap in the face for me at least to, to at least to have jump started that. So. Oh, absolutely. Like I look back at moments over my hockey career as well and go back to the same thing. It's like, Oh, if I would have done this then instead of waiting, you know what I mean? Where now that everything, the hockey's over and you kind of look back on it, it's, it's, you're kind of just grateful for where everything kind of did fall into place, you know, to what, what did happen that you did get to experience. And then you talk about like the studying and how they gave you tutors and all of that type of stuff. People of stories have gone through the media, multiple stories, stuff like that, where um, athletes really don't have to work that hard at their education because they kind of like get like a freebie, a handout to get these kids to play. Did you see any of that at the university of Wisconsin or was it, was it, everybody's got to do their work. Yeah. I'm glad you asked that. I can maybe set the record straight a little bit. So um, yeah, you hear the stories, I think like North Carolina where they're making up classes and, you know, giving athletes A's and it's definitely not like that. The, I'd say the perks that we get right yet. So yes, yeah, so we do get a, um, tutors and, and, you know, people assigned to help you out in picking classes and times we may get to choose classes a little bit earlier than normal students, but we also have, you know, athletic schedules that we need to go around and things of that nature. So that's probably the, the two biggest um, advantages we had outside of that. I mean, we're, we're normal students. I mean, if, unless I'm going to be there for one or two years and I'm going to go play pro hockey, they may give you a little guidance on, Hey, these are the classes that are a little bit easier that um, it, it doesn't matter if you're going to take them or not um, because you're not going to graduate anyway. But I'd say for 90, maybe 90% of the athletes, you're, you're a normal student. So you put in your, I'll put this in a perspective. So I'd probably wake up at, at six in the morning, um, get up, head to the rink. We would either do some type of workout or stretch or whatever it was, have breakfast at the rink in class by eight. Um, probably wouldn't get home till like eight or nine at night. So classes throughout the day, practice mixed in there. You have obviously your lifts involved with that too. And then the nutrition side of it. So they, they crunch everything into a day. So it's at least I'm, I'm honestly, I was probably at the rink like six hours a day. Um, and then class another five to six, depending on classes. I mean, that can obviously fluctuate, but I mean, you're a student athlete for sure. So kind of circling back to you said your nutrition, obviously being a huge part of obviously still being a young athlete growing and making sure that you're keeping yourself up to date as a college athlete. We kind of talked about before how there's this, the NCAA is looking into paying kids for likeness and image and stuff like that. Um, and one thing we talked about is a lot of these guys, a lot of these young guys and women as well have these full ride scholarships, but they don't have this extra money to be able to, have extra food provide like get clothes stuff like that um I guess kind of elaborate on that as far as was that kind of an issue where that little extra money from the university would have helped or were you on a good enough plan through like the union or cafeteria or whatever it would have been that you'd never really had to worry about it yeah I think I mean they they did a pretty good job and and sufficing with I'd say most of the needs I mean obviously based on you know, whatever your scholarship was, right. And if you had to pay the difference or, you know, you had all the money coming in to help out with, you know, tuition and housing and all that, but they did a really good job. Um, we call it Christmas. I think it was the first day of school. So that would be the first official day of hockey. You come in and your locker is lined with, and we were Adidas at the time. So uh, three or four pairs of shoes, shorts, shirts, hoodies, like your whole track stuff. So they, they deck you out in a, and enough like their their swag at the time to at least get you through I'd say a week without having to wash your stuff so that's nice um, food wise they were really good um, we always had breakfast every day and then training table after practice so we always had two out of the three meals provided um, and it started to grow a little bit after it would have been my I guess my fourth year so it would have been 20 
13, 2014, that season is when the NCAA started kind of coming out with extra stipends and how they were going to address feeding athletes more. And they started implementing more snacks, um, take home opportunities. So, I mean, when you walk in the locker room and there's obviously they always provide protein and, you know, protein bars, whatever at the time, I mean, but we would get, you know, you have your fruit right, right in the locker room to grab. You'd have um, aloe shakes, you know, it, you, you name it, they had it and beef jerky. I mean, that was another big one. And, uh, it, it just got to the point where it was, you know, you go home and you have enough snacks to last for dinner. So they did a really good job. And, uh, um, and on top of it, they would give you some type of stipend or they called it a red card at university of Wisconsin, where you could go out and either spend, it was like 20 bucks at the market a day or go to like noodles or wherever and have, a meal for $20. So it was a pretty good trade-off. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think they still should be paid, but um, they're taken care of pretty well. That's good to hear. You do hear a lot of stories about athletes, especially more so in the football department, because those guys are just different animals about how they don't, how they like need more food in and they don't get enough provided to them like by the university and stuff, obviously like Alabama and stuff like that. That's taken care of by the booster club in Wisconsin for Madison. Is there a booster club for the hockey team? Do you guys get any sort of, I guess, um, extra perks benefits to being a part of Wisconsin athletics or more so the, the hockey team there? Yeah, there's definitely a booster club. I wouldn't say it really pertains as much to the hockey team as I've seen like involvement with basketball and football. They used to always do like a booster dinner um, for, for all the people and alumni, whoever, you know, was contributing. I know um, hockey wise, we would always just send out thank yous and, you know, things of that nature, but never really too much interaction. Um, you know, I used to hear stories of the hundred dollar handshake. So I, I saw it once I never got it. So I did see it one time. I'm not going to say who it was, but, uh, um, it's not like, you know, you're at least for the hockey guys, it's not like you're getting envelopes of money or anything or new right. cars or, um, things that you're in like the sec and, you know, major football schools, but, um, I'm sure it's out there. I just, like I said, I saw one handshake with a hundred dollar bill in it. And that's, that's the extent that I saw. It's kind of talking about other, I guess, collegiate sports, um, at least in a high, high school atmosphere, you have the football guys picking on the basketball guys and basketball picking on wrestling and stuff. At the college level, did you have a lot of interaction with other like basketball, football athletes that you would hang out with them, have that friendly banter and kind of do stuff outside of your sport? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. It's actually something I don't get asked a lot about. We did, we were, uh, I don't know if it was just because our group was so tight knit and uh, uh, you know, the guys we come in with, right. So we all come in for summer classes and you get to know all the incoming freshmen from football, from basketball, from wrestling. Um, those are probably the three main groups that we hung out with. So got to form some really good friendships with the football and wrestling guys. Um, not as many basketball guys, but um, I mean, for example, I had a guy stand up in my wedding Um like I think two Septembers ago from the basketball team. So yeah, we, there was a lot of cross, you know, hanging out with just because you have similar schedules, similar interests. Um, we weren't able to stay in the dorms as well. Um, just from, I guess, past negative experiences from the hockey guys, they wouldn't allow hockey guys to stay in dorms. So, you know, we had to form all these bonds with ourselves and then, you know, you have an apartment so you can have, house parties and you invite your friends that you know and it just happens to be the football basketball wrestling guys so I'd, I'd say the the people we didn't get along with the most was probably the frat guys so we would go to the college club which is in the notorious sports bar mainly the hockey bar in madison and it's right on lake and langdon street so um langdon is where all the fraternities and sororities are and so kind of funnel down there and you know got to be really good friends with a lot of linebackers, a lot of offensive linemen, a lot of, you know, like the big guys in wrestling. And it was great. You walk into the bar and you have your entourage with you, vice versa. And you're, yeah, frat guys, just beware. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's awesome. Yeah. A lot, everything that you do here, like we've talked about, at least from the outside looking in about Wisconsin itself as a university, how they've kind of spread the wealth in all their sports with getting all their sports to a certain level of being able to compete instead of where some universities just have a good basketball team or a good track team where Wisconsin's kind of across the board, like the girls hockey team, like your sister, I believe, right? She played for the women's team when you were still playing there, correct? Yep. 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 How cool is that? Yeah, it was great. Um, I, I wouldn't say great. I had to see her quite a bit, but uh, <laughs> um, no, it, it was, it was really exciting. I, you know, their schedule was kind of similar to ours. So at least, you know, get to see her play on Sundays when we were off. And my, my parents obviously loved it. They could come down Friday night, watch us and her Saturday, watch us, you know, grab dinner, lunch, whatever, and then stay for Sunday for her last game. So it was, it was a great interaction um, to be able to be there with, you know, my sister and to be able to experience that is uh, I'd say it's pretty rare. I, I'm trying to think back siblings on opposite teams. I think the last time it happened was before, for me was the Burish, the Burishes. So um, that would have been like, that would have been 06 when they, when they both teams won it. So were you guys both captains? Uh, she wasn't. She no. wasn't. Okay. Oh. For some reason, I thought you guys both were captains too. And then I was like, that's insane. Yeah, no, she's not, I don't, she's not really a leader, I guess. So yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take a shot at her. Might as well. <laughs> so you talking about the getting together, the sharing, do you guys all share the same like workout facilities or do, do each of the their own sports have their own type of area? Yeah. So I know it's, it's a little different now, but when I was there, we would mainly work out at the Cole center. So uh, the Cole center weight room would have been men's and women's hockey, men's and women's basketball. And I want to say swimming was there too. Um, and then the Cole center or excuse me, the camp Randall would house football, women's volleyball, uh, track, and maybe, maybe soccer or something like that, whatever it was. Um, and golf would kind of intertwine with both places. So, um, it just kind of depended on what sport you were and where they located you, but obviously playing at the Cole center, we were there. And, um, so yeah, I mean, you would do, it's a big enough workout facility where you could have probably two or three teams in there. So there'd be a lot of like cross interaction with maybe the women's hockey team was in there. And for the majority, they're doing the same lifts and stuff, but yeah, it was, it was kind of neat. Awesome. How, how is the travel? How does, how does the travel work when say you got a game Friday night in back at the time, the WCHA, Alaska, I believe was, the farthest trip that you guys had to make. How was, how, how did the schedule work when you guys had to travel like certain distance you'd fly certain, is it always a bus? Yeah. What, you want to dive into that a little bit? You, sure you guys want to hear this? Yeah. <laughs> this is why I didn't play pro hockey after. So we would, the only time we bust was to Minnesota. So I think it was like a four hour bus trip. That was it. Everywhere else we took a private charter or private plane so they would roll out, I don't know, like literally there'd be 30 to 35 of us and they'd roll out 737 and we would jump on from the tarmac. You don't go through security. You jump on, you land in the private airport, bus is there waiting for you. It takes you to most likely the rink. You do a pregame skate. Um, and then right after you get in, you know, dress casual, everything but a tie and you go to dinner. So I mean, we were, we were eating at the nicest steakhouses on the road, um, which was amazing. I mean, you go out to dinner and, you know, my, my favorite place to play was probably Alaska. Um, that trip was a little different. You leave on a Wednesday, um, fly in, get your stuff, you know, do your team practice. Um, that We did do commercial, so it was all right. But our team meal was seafood. And, like, I have family up there as well. But um, by far my favorite trip, best food, hands down. Um, but I mean, you, you, you'll play in the cities and you stay at the St. Paul hotel down there and you eat at the St. Paul grill and it's I don't know, $150 a plate. Like, so I, you know, you go from the penthouse to the dog house. If you're playing in the East coast, you're on a bus, you're eating meatball subs. It's, yeah. I mean, that was a big reason. So, but I, I'd say the, the only downside of, of that as well is 
with a private plane, you don't get to stay anywhere. So you don't get to go out and experience what those campuses are like. I mean, the best thing about Alaska is that we would take a red eye back on, call it Sunday morning. And uh, uh, it would have been, it was my first trip up there, my sophomore year. So um, uh, maybe junior, I, I forget the year. And uh, uh, it would have been, it would have been my technically my second year there. So when we won the WCA championship and uh, we ended up sweeping, McCabe was gone. He was playing on world juniors. So I get to take his place, run the power play, do all this stuff. We sweep. And our captain at the time was like, Hey, a couple of us are going to go out. You guys, you know, you, you guys want to, I'm like, Ab absolutely. Like we're going to, we're going to run this town up, whatever we want to do. We ended up going to the strip club that night. There's four of us. So it's, you know, team captain. So I'm like, I can't, I can't get into trouble. Like I'm with this guy and our leading scorer and uh, another one of my classmates. And it's two o'clock and it's closing out. And we're like, it's like 30 minutes from the hotel. We're like, Oh my God, like the hell are we going to get home? And uh, we end up walking outside in the flight. Mind you, we have to be up at five to go to the airport. So we're like, holy, like, holy shit, how, how are we going to get home? We look over and there's the refing crew from our game that night. They're like, hey, boys, jump on in. We're staying at the same hotel. <laughs> so they took us back. And uh, thank God Eves and those guys were sleeping. Oh, otherwise, it would have been a long next week. So. <laughs> Oh, that's an, yeah. that's a, that's a great story. That's a great story to share. Um, <laughs> sticking with, sticking with on the road. Um, yeah. what was the best barn that you got to play in? And also I know at least in juniors, sometimes you'd have the other team fucking with your shit. Did any of that type of stuff ever happen at the college level? Not really. So they were, so the bus would always leave on the road the day before us. So they would, we would pack our, our bags and all that stuff. And um, by the time we got there, our stuff was all laid out, all set up for us. And like, no one would have access to it. So I, I, I didn't hear anything um, along those lines of like your gear you know, getting fucked with or anything, but the best rink and best atmosphere is North Dakota, hands down. It's um I mean, outside of the coal center, when it's packed and rocking, I mean, there's 12, I think it's maybe like 13,000 people that are slammed in there. Um, so we roll in, I think bus rolled in about two hours before, and there's a line of students that are, I'd say at least maybe a quarter mile long, and we're pulling in and all of a sudden you just hear pop, pop, pop. I'm like, what the hell? And we're looking at the bus and they're, they're agging the bus. <laughs> and, uh, it, but I mean, that was probably my first game where I was like, holy, holy shit. Like this is for real. I mean, we got into a huge scrum Friday night, maybe like last two minutes. So obviously college, you can't fight. So we get into a, this wrestling match with a guy and it's kind of all you do in college. So I go to the box and you know, all these kids are on their phones. They know my mom's name, my sister's name, they know my girlfriend's name. Like, you know, they know every piece of information that'll piss me off. And they're just feeding it to me. And there's probably 50 of them leaning over the glass, just chirping down my throat. So it was a really good experience. Out East, this one too, like BU and BC, just with the history and stuff. And then obviously any Minnesota games, uh, a good one too. So Yeah, that Ralph Engelstead Arena is unbelievable when that yeah. place is rocking. I, I think that that even surpasses any NHL rink I've ever been at for a game. Obviously it'd probably be different in the playoffs or Stanley cup finals, but watching being there as a kid. And then I, I went there as a camp actually with uh Kusel shout out. You guys know who he is. Um, we went there and TJ Oshie was actually my, my like camp counselor and he like hooked us up with everything. And then he ended up hooking up, my junior team with tickets to St. Louis blues game when we were in St. Louis a weekend, he got us a box and all, all that type of stuff. So that was pretty cool to see him still like remembering who you are, that type of thing. Who, who would you say was the coolest person like idolized member that you got to play with when you were at Wisconsin? Oh man. Um, or, and also after that, sorry for cutting you off. Yeah. And who, who did you play against that also is that same type of pedigree? 
Yeah. So there's probably two of them. And one of them I didn't get to play with, but I, I got to live with my, it would have been my first summer. So doing your summer classes and then freshman year starts, I got to live with Brendan Smith. So, um, you know, first rounder to Detroit, he's still playing in the NHL, um, for the Rangers right now. And, uh, got to know him and, uh, anytime he's in town, we'll grab drinks or whatever, but he, that guy can pound alcohol. Like <laughs> I've never seen anyone hold their liquor or drink as much as him. And, uh, you know, being a small town, Wisconsin kid, I'm like, I'll, ch I'll challenge you. Like, I'm, I'm not afraid. Had a, I had some calculus tests the next morning, which I don't know what the hell I was even going out for. Like, yeah, I plan to have a long night. Right. So we ended up going out and we go to nitty gritty for power hour and he had already signed his contract. So everything was on him. So it was a great night. It, you know, everything's free, whatever. I couldn't tell you how many drinks we had. It was a table of, I don't know, four by four, something like that. There was not a room to put a drink by the end of the night um, for the power hour. So he had bought in the whole table of drinks and it was just him and I. So we ended up drinking those. And then I, I don't know, even know where we went after that. I was, I was smashed after that. So ended up, you know, going back to the place. He probably took care of me. I missed my math test the next day and was like, be fucking kidding me so um yeah he was he was a good influence just a great guy the other guy was justin schultz um got to play with him for two years probably just one of the most like humble um down-to-earth people when he's sober um when he drinks he gets a little i mean you get to see the little like cockiness out of him but that's the only time i mean he's a one of my probably favorite human beings that i got to play with and against um in that time period so um I'd say a guy on the outside um, played with him in Sioux city and then played against him in um, Penn state is Tommy Olchek. Um, you guys probably know his dad is Ed Eddie. Ed, yep. Edzo. So um, yeah, he's a, he's just an amazing, amazing human being as well that we get along with, you know, so well and, you know, invite him to the wedding, like all that stuff. So just a guy you can pick up with after a year, if you don't talk to him or, you know, it feels like a week. So just a, he's yeah he's a good dude yeah that's awesome i always talk about hockey uh the relationships you build since it's such like a small community you can pretty much walk into any rink across the country and see one person that you could pick up a conversation with and be like oh I've, I've heard of you or that type of deal it's really cool uh <laughs> question what how how was it being coached by mike eaves um, from the outside, it seems like he's a little bit of a fiery guy, uh, cutthroat type of, was, was that how he was or? Yeah, he was, uh, extremely intense. Like he was the guy who demanded perfection to, to the T. I mean, that was his, that was his MO and like mistakes. It, and, you know, he played favorites and I guess like you learn that throughout time and like just kind of depends on what style of player you are and like what your leash is you know, obviously not playing my fresh, my first year and then playing two games second year, like I had to play mistake free hockey versus, you know, a guy like Mark Zangerly, if you turn the puck over, he's, he's going to get to go out next shift. But I mean, he demanded perfection. Um, it depends on the day when you caught him of how his mood was going to be. Um, but he, he really was a great coach. I mean, he understood the game extremely well. Um, he played it at an extremely high level as well so i mean that his whole pedigree into that but um you know we with anything with passion on both sides you're gonna butt heads so we we've had our fair share of encounters and arguments and whatever you want to call them but getting to um, fuck you matches yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't say like you know you hear the stories on like you know spitting chicklets and um uh, what's the other one missing curfew i've been listening to a little bit where you know like the mike Keane stories where he wasn't waiting for you to tell him to fuck off because if you did, I mean, yeah, you, you weren't playing the rest of the game, but I don't know. It, it was, it was a whole, it was a different dynamic. So as I'm trying to be as politically correct as possible on that, I mean, he's, I like him. I really do. So it was just, it was challenging to play for him at times. Yeah. He had, he had a lot of success for the Badgers. Yep. And then it's, it was unfortunate and sad to see how the end of his coaching career kind of ended with, Wisconsin in the way that it did um you were you on one of the teams 
one of those years where it was really bad? Yeah, so it would have been, so my third year is the year we won WCHA championship, made the tournament. The so next all time high. Yep. Next year we won the Big Ten tournament. We were the one seed going into the um, national tournament. Loss. So that would have been my class. Everyone left or signed basically after that. And then my fifth year was the first year of it. So that would have been my captain year. And it was, it was bad. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the exact, you know, rhyme or reason. I know you look at like recruiting and stuff of that nature. It definitely fell off the table when his assistants, um, Patrick and Oz left, but you know, I, I mean, who, who knows to be completely honest. So. How hard is it to, we've I talked about the Buffalo Sabres and the the stretch that they went through with them losing games and kind of it gets to a point where you really don't have any pressure on you anymore and it's kind of on the other team to that'll look like the fool if they lose was it did it ever get to that point or was it come on let's just hold it together let's just make it through the season and everybody's going to kind of move on type deal yeah, so kind of twofold with that. The 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 year we won WCHA, uh, I think we started off like one seven and two. I think we have it. It's like printed on our rings. I mean, we were bad, and it was miserable to be at the rink. And it's not like we were a bad team. We had I don't know, like seven or eight NHL guys on that team, so like it wasn't talent. It was just, just kind of going through a shitty stretch. And um, so we we were actually able to overcome that and you know build off that. Um, the last year, it was kind of a different story. Um, at first, it was we had enough guys from that team left over where it was like, hey, we've gone through this before. Let's yeah, just continue to fight and build. And like you said, eventually you get to a point where it's like, fuck it. Like, you don't have anything to lose. So, but it just, it never got better. Like, it, it just never progressively got better. I mean, we had maybe a couple stretches where there was a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. And then you know, the next week he gets swept or whatever it is, or, you know, someone gets injured or something along those lines where it just deflates you. So yeah, we just honestly couldn't catch a break. And, um, you know, we didn't have the firepower either that we had that one year either. So. Kind of circling back um, like a couple minutes ago, you were talking about some of your uh, hockey idols, people you, got along with really well people you just um respected and stuff like that outside of the hockey world again being the non-hockey guy in the room all through all those kind of questions when you're at wisconsin what i guess either other coaches from other teams or other athletes um again kind of circling back to guys you hung out with it sounds like you had a good um camaraderie with some other guys who were some other athletes outside of hockey that you really got along with yeah, so our freshman class, we really got to be good friends with James White, uh, the running back for the Patriots. So um, I haven't talked to him in a while, but I mean, we randomly played like Call of Duty like last year, shit like that. So I'm um, still keeping touch. I'd say like more of acquaintances now. Um, look at like Big Rob Havenstein. He's an offensive lineman for the Rams. Um, got to be really good friends with him. Um, look at Jack Sitchie. So he was you know, three Jack, three sack Jack in that one bowl game, just won the Super Bowl with the Bucks. Um, you look at, there's another guy, Kurt Phillips. He was a, like a highly touted quarterback coming in and got to know him really well. So on the basketball side, the, the one guy is, um, is Bruss and Kaminsky, I guess, two guys that really got to know and hang out with. And, you, you know, like I said, spend more time with outside of the rink. And um, I mean, we were down in, a couple years ago, Brust uh, took me to Frank's place. He's, I don't know how he got this. He uh, got to basically live in this guy's penthouse downtown. It's like a four story, like on the 80th floor, 80th through 84th floor, whatever the hell building he's in that he got to live in. And he ended up taking us out that night downtown. So we went to a club, um, you know, walk in and uh, he's seven feet. So like, everyone is like, what the hell? Like you walk to the line, he goes, Hey guys, like my group's here, whatever we walk in like VIP area. He's like booze girls, like whatever you guys want, just like, let me know. And I'm like, like, that's the first time I've ever been in a club too. So I've never been back. Like it, it was like, but I mean, just the experiences from like being able to 
know and get to know those guys has, has been, it's been insane. Like literally just stories on stories of stuff that never or nor should have been a part of or had any opportunity to be involved with um, because of my time at Wisconsin. So it's, it's fun to look back. Like I was, you know, like I said, I was trying to think of stories and things that have kind of occurred over the years because of it. And it's just, it's a, uh, it's fun to go down memory lane at times. So. Yeah, it definitely seems like all the, the athletes that have ever come out of Wisconsin, even like Russ over in Seattle, always throwing up the W, always shouting out Wisconsin, JJ Watt as well. Um, some notable guys that have come out of Wisconsin, they're always paying homage to where they come from, whether they grew up there, obviously JJ, JJ Watt being from Pewaukee, he has more ties to the Madison area. But yeah, like I said, everybody's always proud to say they're a Wisconsin Badger. Yeah, definitely. It, it's a it's a thing of uh, honor. Um, it's something that you know I think everyone takes. I, I wouldn't call it an oath by any means, but that's kind of what it is. I mean, you join the brotherhood or sisterhood, depending if you know your boy or girl, right? So I mean, it's something that you know I, I'm I'll be proud of, and uh, as an alumni till the day I die. And I think a lot of like you said, a lot of athletes are, and it's it's more of a humble. Uh, more of a humble school when it comes to sports, right? It's not flashy. It's not, you know, they're out, you think of football, right? It's, it's, they're run, they're a run first team. They're not going to spread you basketball. They run their swing. They slow down shot clocks. Like they're not going to beat you hundred to 90 hockey's kind of the, maybe the, the only hybrid right now, but it's also not one of the, you know, major sports at the university when it comes to notoriety but you just get all these blue collar, you know, kids who are grateful to be there. And, and, and at the end with the education or the opportunity to play professionally, they're, they're extremely honored and humbled to, um, to be a part of that university. So it's, it's kind of cool to see. Um, just like you said, like you see all these, all these big time athletes that, I mean, Russell's was only there for a year. He was at NC state for three and like, that's his school. That's his, that's his lineage now. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's awesome um, that you feel that. And being all of us from Wisconsin, it's it's awesome to see the our like top unit, our state school, basically having the reputation that it does have throughout the nation of being top educational, top party school, and we do very well in sports all across the board i know that we do a lot with like cancer research and stuff as well so like the university of wisconsin really kind of makes wisconsin what it is in a sense of that type of culture of you got it all you, you know really you kind of got it all and then turning back to being at wisconsin and how hockey doesn't have the repertoire as like the hockey or the football team with the women's team winning as many championships and always being at the top even when you were there they've been since probably like 08 I want to say they've been pretty much at the top all the time did they have a little bit of swagger on campus of like hey we're the best we're the best yeah, I think, I, you know, I, I wouldn't say as much. I mean, right. I mean, it basically you look at the sports and it's all revenue driven, right? So they're the ones who are going to get their faces on billboards or they're the ones getting highlights, whereas women's hockey gets overshadowed to say the least when it's kind of sad. Like you said, they've had the most success in the last, yeah, like maybe 15 years or whatever, pick your time frame, 20 years, whatever, out of any program there. I mean, they have six national championships, so that's tied with the men's. Um, they've had Patty Casimir winners uh, three in the last 12 years. So the top women's player, um, and they've had countless Olympians, world champions. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's sad. They definitely get overlooked. I mean, unless you're a true hockey fan, you, you probably don't know who they are. Um, so it's kind of sad, but I'd say that's like, even looking at it, I know like the hockey guys and even on the men's side, I think the guys feel a little bit of, I guess I don't know the word, but maybe like more, more pissed that they don't get like the respect that like basketball and football gets. Like you said, I mean, football is done well, but they've never won a national championship basketball. It's been since 1941. And I remember talking to Bross about this and they retired Kaminsky's Jersey after he, 
after he was player of the year and they don't have, it took him until Tony got in, until Tony Granato got into, to retire uh, Mark Johnson's jersey. Like there are, I don't know, 30 Hall of Famers from the University of Wisconsin that play that, that are, you know, they just get neglected and it, it you know, starts with the men's and the women's hockey program. So I think they don't get the respect they deserve um, both programs, but they've done extremely well and it's fun to be a part of and uh, to watch it. So. Bigger question. We've, t- me and Colin have talked about this multiple times at the university of Wisconsin, like how the women's hockey team gets less than the men, like it gets less than the men's. Is that like that with all female sports compared to men's sports? Yeah. I mean, I, I think so. Right. I mean, again, I, I, I feel personally, it's all revenue driven. So especially at the university, there's only three sports that generate a revenue football, basketball, men's hockey. So like, those are going to get the most attention when it comes to media or anything. But I know budget wise, you know, women's basketball, men's basketball, same budget, things of that nature. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, in, in a lot of it's opinion, like, I, I love watching women's hockey and I might be biased because my sister played, but skill wise, it is unbelievable to watch. I mean, they do stuff, hockey players. Yeah. yeah. They, they do stuff that is, you know, just as good, if not better than the men's and they do it maybe at a faster pace at times because there's less contact and don't get me wrong. There's still contact. It's still physical, but you know, you don't have to worry about getting blown up. So maybe it's the less physicality that takes a, you know, gives that more of a backseat or anything. I mean, a basketball, I, I don't like watching basketball men's or women's to be completely honest. So, um, but yeah, I feel like the, the men's always takes precedent, but that's kind of my opinion. So. Kind of circling back again to um, other sports, like you said, in high school, you're a quarterback, stuff like that. If hockey didn't pan out the way it did, would you, is there another sport you would have may, maybe pursued uh, over the years or was hockey kind of your one shot deal? Yeah. So um, yeah, a lot of people don't know this. So I was, I was a very good athlete in high school. Um, um, so along with hockey, the big thing when I was going out and visiting the Ivy League schools is um, they offered me to play football um, at Princeton. And then when I went to Yale, they offered to have me play baseball as well. So um, I think that was really just more of a lure to, to have me play hockey. Um, I, I love them both. I love um, hockey, excuse me, football and baseball, probably as much as hockey probably miss football more than actually hockey to be completely honest, but I was, just, I was better at hockey. Um, I probably would have just played division two somewhere in football to be completely honest. So, so that, that was also fun getting, uh, I used to get all these division two letters and for football and, you know, they're coming in with hockey and then it's division one or division two and throwing the division two stuff right out. So. With division two, isn't there, I, at least I know with D3, they don't really do scholarships. They more or less just call it grants. And that's kind of the way that D3 does it. Is that the same thing for D2 or is that jump up to scholarships for that? I'm pretty positive. They offer um, athletic scholarships division two. Okay. Yeah. Again, I, I didn't do too much research on it. Um, but from my understanding 13 years ago, that's what it was. So. So let's dive into it here. Badgers, Wisconsin, big party school. Um, you and the boys get after it on some weekends. Um, is there any, any legendary type stories? Because just being a part of the hockey community and playing hockey, being on a team, being with a group of people, no matter what sport it is for a long period of time, you guys become sort of like a family. And when you guys go out and have a good time, there's always definitely – some good, good stories that are definitely worth being shared. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. Like I said, the first good one was the Alaska one, you know, heading to the strip club. Um, you know, we got to know some, you know, teammates and stuff from different areas. So we had one of our goalies coming in my freshman year, my first year and, and Zeng's is from Buffalo. So they're the same age as Kane and uh, that whole Kane Mifflin thing happened when we were there. So 
that was a uh, holy man. I, I won't go in too much detail on it, but I, I remember walking into the college club with him and he had a couple buddies with him. And I mean, he is a young NHL superstar. Like everyone knows who he is. So as soon as it got out, like, I think it was like 11 o'clock, we got to the KK. It was, a uh, uh, you know, Mifflin, the big block party. Right. So, you know, everyone's got their shirts on that we made or whatever. And we walk in and we're probably 15 people in there, 10 minutes. It is packed. Like you cannot move in there. People have their phones out and, and he is blacked out at noon. So like, you know, he's at the bar passed out and everyone's like, Hey, like no pictures, no pictures ended up going to like a frat house and they got into it with some frat guys and, uh, came back and ended up what did he do? He took, he ordered a bunch of pizzas in our room and like just chucked them all over the ceiling, eggs everywhere. I think he ended up breaking our TV and uh, I didn't see him the next morning. I was, my hangovers are terrible and they were back then too. So I didn't see him, but he come out and there's a pile of cash laying on the, uh, on the table and it was like a sorry note. And we're like, <laughs> you're welcome back anytime. If you want to give college kids cash, like we can, we can make do with this shitty broken TV right now. So, uh, but I mean, that, that was a really fun, fun weekend just to be around someone that literally like famous. And like I said, I, I won't go into too much detail on that one because I know, you know, he got in a lot of trouble with it, but oh yeah, it was a really fun weekend. Um, another Alaska story. So our schedule going out, we would go out most mostly every Saturday after a series, obviously, unless we were flying back. Um, if we did well, we'd always have Sunday fun day. And then Monday would be some type nice of game. game. Yeah. Or we would do, it, it's called Wisco versus world. So all the Wisco guys versus, you know, everyone else and you'd play scrimmage and just sweat out the booze and hit the sauna after or whatever. Um, the big night to go out early on was um, Wednesdays and for the hockey guys, because, you'd fly out Thursday or you'd have a Thursday skate, which was really light. So you'd sweat out all the booze and do all that stuff. Um, by the time I left, it, it became Tuesday. It was like the big underage night to let all the sorority girls in at the KK. And like, so we went out one Tuesday night, uh, me, Rumpel and Poppy. And we took out a bunch of the freshmen at the KK and <clears throat> we had to get up and fly to Alaska the next morning. So it was like bus leaves at a 6 AM. Don't be late, whatever. And, uh, you know, this, this is when I'm captain, right? Rumpel's the starting goalie. He's been there. Poppy's, um, you know, maybe missed like two games in his career at this point. It's his fourth year. So we're like, all right, we're going to have a great night. We end up getting smashed. Like I, I left early. I left at like one from my, from my memory ended up, you know, at Cadoba. We always, we used to always get food and, uh, it's like two 30. They're not back yet. So I'm like, I'm like, fuck. All right. Like I'm going to try to stay up. So, I don't set an alarm. They end up coming back maybe like an hour later, they went to McDonald's and, and came back. Um, they didn't set an alarm. So we are getting, you know, the next morning comes around phones are just, you know, blowing up, blowing up like texts, calls. Hey, where are you guys at? It's five 55. And all of a sudden, you know, I wake up, I run down the hall, Poppy Rumple, wake up. Poppy or Rumple's like, no, no, no. Hey guys, a couple more minutes, a couple more minutes. And we're like, fuck you. We got five minutes to get from nitty gritty to the bus. Like, so we, we used to live close to the rink close enough where five minutes is plenty of time. No one has their shit packed. No one has anything. So the bus is leaving as we're sprinting with our shit across the coal center lawn. Like we have our suit bags, we're in our, whatever, our warm up suits that you fly in. And you know, Eber is pissed. So they stopped the bus right outside the coal center and, you know, you just see everyone against the glass with their phone. They're Snapchatting us. And we're like, fuck. So we get on the bus. I'm the first one. And I'm like, coach, sorry. He's like, get to the fucking back. And we're like, oh, God. Like, oh, my God. Like, reek like booze, like all this shit. And uh, they would do assigned seating on the plane. Well, my last name is Drake Eves. So I have to sit next to him. And I fucking, I literally smell like I just, you know, got out of a, got out of a brewery, basically fell into, fell into a K and he's just like, you guys, and this is our first trip of the year, by the way, new year, like captain, we have 10 freshmen coming in. He's like, so we're sitting there and he's like, way to set a fucking example for the young guys. <laughs> and, uh, I'm like, Hey, I'm like, I just, you know, we gotta, you know, 
find some time to apologize or whatever. And we ended up telling him we were up studying late and um, he had this thing called emotional bank account. So he'd be like, all right, you got to build up your EBA. So you build up, you know, your, your EBA with good deeds or staying late, showing up early. And he would, he asked one of the assistant captains, he was like, Joseph, why aren't these three being punished? And, you know, Labate's like, I have no idea. He's like, cause they have a high enough EBA. And uh, Rumpel looks at me. He's like, he's like, I'm just fucking glad I was with you. Otherwise I'd be off the team, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. So that, that's the start of the year where it just shit just went downhill. Right. So not a, not a good prelude, hell of a night. Um, but not good. But yeah, Rumpel seems to be like a focal point in these stories. Like he was shit. He was a three, maybe four year starter. Like good. He's in the, he's still in the AHL actually for, uh, um, Iowa wild. He just signed a couple weeks ago. So he's playing in Iowa and doing well, but he, um, he, a lot of talent loved to booze. Like, I don't know how, or how he could perform, like do all this stuff. And he's from Saskatchewan. So he had a couple buddies come down and, uh, we ended up one night at Cadoba late one night. And, uh, there's a guy in rollerblades ahead of us and Rumpel's girlfriend his now wife. Um, she was just like, Hey, this guy just like fucking grabbed me. So to go up to the register and to order, you have to go up the stairs. It's like eight, eight steps. So I'm like, really? Like I, I get kind of tough when I'm drunk. Right. So, I mean, who doesn't? So I'm like, really? So I fucking shove him down the steps. Like hindsight, not a good idea. And his he was on rollerblades. He's on rollerblades. <laughs> so like he obviously immediately just goes, Whoa, like, yeah, he's like, I'm like, oh my God, like, don't like, you know, at first thought I was like, please God, don't land on your head was, I didn't realize he had buddies. There's like four of them. So, and it's three of Rumpel's buddies, myself and Rumpel. So five of us are like, Hey, you guys want to do this? So we're like, yeah. So we go outside of uh, Cadoba on state street and we get a literally like a line brawl on the street. Um, cops end up showing we uh, we run out of there the guy one of his buddies like lost his shoes he was like took his shoes off and was beating the shit out of one guy with a shoe and like i mean it's just stupid shit like that but that's the stuff i remember probably the most just these you know these these stories of just and none of us got in trouble for it so like maybe that's another perk of being athletes you might get the benefit of the doubt too but i mean fucking rump i think he got arrested too at, at on campus i think he jumped on a police horse and tried to ride it and uh, the cop it was right i remember this we were right outside the kk he uh jumped on the horse and the cop was right there and yanked back the reins and rumple went right over the top and just landed right on his face like cut his whole face up that guy is a walking story so he's like a legend dude yeah, he he literally <laughs> is man like Probably one of the nicest human beings I've ever met, too. So. Oh, that's almost every hockey player. They're super, super nice, but then you get a few beers into them, and they can party with the best of them. Like, yeah. every single one of them. That just brought back a few stories from back in the day as well. Getting into a few uh, off-the-ice scruffles with some with some guys when you're with the boys. Mm -hmm. You know they got to your back, so it's always, always a good time. So, I'll, I'll give you one more. So, we were walking in um, – this would have been maybe like my junior season. So like my best friends from back home were just had graduated college. So I was two years of, I guess, behind them in school, right. Playing juniors. So they were like, Hey, like any, any opportunity you have like to have us down, we'd love to. So it's, I, there's like five buddies I have come down and uh, one of them was my best man in my wedding. Like, Lee Pekka, you guys, you might know him. If, if not, a little short guy. And, you know, we walk in the bar and I, I always tell him three things. I'm like, hey, don't open a tab. Don't leave without me. And don't start a fight without me. Like, those are the three things I always tell him. Like, we got treated very well at the bar. Like, so all that stuff. Don't leave without me because they don't know where the fuck they're going anyway, right? So, and then don't start a fight because they'll get kicked out. So we're in the bar or whatever. And Leroy, and I tell him this and I'm like, and this guy just, I don't know what he was doing. He kept fucking with him, right? Just fucking with him. And I'm like, he's like, Hey, can I fight this guy? I'm like, I'm like, I look and I'm like, yeah, let's, let's do it. So we go over there and I put the guy, you know, his arms behind his back and Leroy just starts fucking swinging at him. And I'm like, Oh, I'm like, all right, here we go. Here we go. Bouncers come in. They're 
you know, big guys like ex football guys or, you know, the meatheads at the gym. Right. And, um, they pick both Lee and this other guy up and I'm like, Hey, that guy's with me. That guy's with me. They set them down and they toss the other guy out of the bar. And like, it's like common occurrence. Like, so it's I mean, just stupid shit like that. That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. Wisconsin definitely has that reputation. Definitely for anybody who's never been down there and participated in like, do they still do Mifflin or is that thing? Is that, has that been like officially stopped for forever now? I, I think they still do it. Um, I, I haven't been down there in a while for that. I'm a little old for it, <laughs> but um, I would assume last year they didn't. Uh, I mean, I think last year might've been probably one of the only years they haven't, but it's a lot different. My freshman year was like the real Mifflin, like where it was, 60,000 people on that street walking like nowhere to go and then someone got stabbed at the house next to us so we were at one of the hockey players houses there and someone got like stabbed on the balcony and like that's when they tried to start shutting it down um but yeah so it wasn't the same after that but yeah I was gonna say Mifflin's always a great time Badger football games always are a, a wreck you could just drive into Madison and you can pretty much walk into anybody's backyard and start partying with all these college kids <laughs> and they don't give no fucks at all. Like it is amazing, but I'm just going to go back here. I got a couple more questions here before we yeah. wrap it up here. So playing for the Badgers, them with the prestige that they kind of have as, like you said, they do have six titles for hockey. Um, do they have the, is it the type of atmosphere where they set you up to where you think it would prepare you for the NHL as far as what you need to do to like work on yourself, like nutrition wise, like stretching, just making sure you're taking care of yourself in all of the areas, whether you need like that extra hand, like to help you do it, or do they just have the kids that are already kind of on that next path to where there's like, okay, these are the guys that are going to, get that extra treatment yeah so they they do an unbelievable job so that was probably one of the biggest reasons why I chose Wisconsin was at the time I thought it was going to give me the best opportunity to play professional hockey with the coaching staff um, but in reality if it didn't work out I was you know still going to be able to get that education um, you know I mean they're starting to get back to that point where it's becoming a, a powerhouse to basically bring kids in for two to three years and then pump them out to the NHL. So they do a really good job with um, developing the players now. And I'd say a big reason and part of it is, you know, looking back is Osiki. So that was the reason why I came in. And as soon as my class got in, they, they left. So it's kind of shitty timing. Um, but, you know, I look and I'll, I'll come back to your, your question here, but the year before I came in, there was four first rounders, a second rounder and a fifth rounder on the blue line on that team. So, I mean, that's what they're trying to build it back to when it, you know, kind of the identity got lost. I mean, you're looking at all these kids leaving now, right? You know, you have Caulfield, you have Emerson, you have Weisbach, you probably have Holloway might leave. Um, And they all just signed recently within the last few days. Yeah. But so you're looking at, you know, the two to three year of, of development of on the player side, you know, their, their biggest thing is they develop you as a, as a person though. So like Granado is, quote unquote, the like ultimate human being, like, yes, he cares about hockey. He cares about hockey and that whole aspect of it, but he is there to make you a better person first. So like, that's the biggest thing, but then every other aspect they take care of, like they take care of nutrition. There's a nutritionist. They obviously have a weight, uh, a strength coach, right. Who works with you with on the stretching side, the yoga side, you have masseuses, they have mental coaches. Like they go through every aspect that you need that you have at the professional level, they have there. So you're getting like blood tests, physicals, VO2 tests, all that stuff to optimize your guys's potential. For sure. So you would do in the summers, we would do um, our VO2 max. We would do, oh God, this bike test. Um, yep, that's that's the classic one. There's another one though, where they drop the weight and they check. It's basically to check your power output. I forget the name of it now. Um, but it's like a standard measuring tool in the NHL. And like, they put you in all every opportunity to experience it before you have to do it 
professionally for a, you know, for a paycheck. So they, they give you the tools and the ammo and the, the opportunity to, you know, like I said, get your hands on it early, but then also it helps you too. So it's, it's kind of twofold when it comes to that. It's not just for the experience. It's, it's to see where you're at and then to help you develop into what you want to become. So, um, I mean, we were, we would do DEXA scans where they would, you know, you go lay basically on an MRI table and it takes a look at body fat. And then they would, the nutritionist comes in and they talk about body composition, what you need to be eating for, how are you feeling on energy? Um, you know, anything when it comes to anything nutrition, right? So I, I'm not that well versed into it. Um, and we would do these, these things in, in the summer, it was kind of like a flexibility test. So it would just kind of show of like range of motion, how much power you can exude from it. And like, it is extremely technical and kind of the way kids are starting to get involved in not only hockey, but other sports and the training aspect of it, it's starting to trickle down into new sports now. And it's starting to become just kind of common knowledge and a, a consistency in, in that world. Yeah, the technology world has definitely made all those things accessible to where everybody wants to maximize their potential. Yeah. Um, just real quick, when um, you're talking about like flexibility, all that type of stuff, when it comes to injuries and stuff like that, you were blessed to not have any anything crazy happen to you while you, you played down there. But for somebody who would have a severe injury, would that be taken care of by the university? Like, do they just zip them over to the UW hospital and fix them up and everything's good to go? And yeah, yeah, great question. So I, I you're, like you said, I never um, had a major injury, but they, the athletic training staff on hand um, is top notch. Like our, our trainer has been there for I, 20 years. Um, and the guy is unbelievable. Um, so if anything major happens, they call in the team doctor right away. So there's a team doctor that travels with the team, um, or maybe has like dual, you know, maybe men's and women's hockey, but specializes in that sport, right? You're going to see a lot of knee and hip and, um, lacerations, you know, stitches, whatever it is. So they'll travel with, and if it's anything super major, they'll take you right to UW and, and operate on you. And that team doctor will most likely operate on you or get things done in the locker room. But um, yeah, everything's taken care of by the university. And, um, and if they need to get a second opinion, or I know a lot of guys have, you know, when their, their rights are drafted, the, like, let's just say you're drafted by Buffalo. Like they always want the university doctor look at you and they'll bring in like the Buffalo doctor for second opinions or anything. So I wouldn't say they're too, um, to, I wouldn't say high on their horse to provide that second opinion because it's about, again, the next step and they realize it. So that, that's kind of a cool dynamic as well. That's awesome. That's awesome to see that. Um, do you, have you s still um, like watched Badgers hockey? Like since you've moved on, is that something that you regularly still pay attention to? Yeah, no, I, I pay attention. I wouldn't say I watch it um, as much as I used to. So early on, we would, you know, I live with Poppy right after for a couple of years till I got married and my wife, you know, we did our own thing, right? So Poppy and I would go to quite a few games and they're really good with alumni in person. Um, we get two tickets to every game. So I'll try to go to maybe like two to three a year in person. And then um, if we're, you know, the boys are back in town, we'll grab some beers and watch the game, but they want the alumni to be super involved, which is, it's great. I mean, whether you play professionally or not, like they want you there and it's, um, like I said, it's a brotherhood. So it's, it's great to be a part of. And, um, the other thing I, I, I coach as well with team, with team Wisconsin now. So their systems are intertwined with Wisconsin and, you know, they provide us film. They let us have access to practice. So that's a whole nother side of it that I'm involved in that I get to see that's that otherwise I wouldn't care about anymore so it's it's refreshing to see you know when I played because it's the style is different now than um, what it was right so it's kind of different to see the changes and what the game's like at that level because all the systems are NHL systems so it's you get to compare it to the teams you watch now and how they play and just the little nuances you don't think about anymore so yeah, do, do, for the people who don't understand hockey and especially, do you just want to dive into a little bit about like um, what t 
teams kind of do like when they run these systems i know for like just to give like a basic understanding since you do coach and you help younger kids out just to give a basic understanding for the people who don't know much about hockey or what they're seeing when they're seeing it on the television yeah so i mean traditionally you think of right i mean just basic three forwards and two defenders right and one goalie i mean that's that's the standard setup um and you think forwards are there to score goals d are there to help prevent goalie obviously is you know, there to stop the puck. Right. But I think the way the game's evolved and the way it's being played now is it's, it's really more in five man units. So you're starting to see, and this kind of happened back in 2015, there's a really big shift and it started with the Blackhawks. They started running um, with like Duncan Keith and things of, you know, and, and Seabrook, right. Those were guys who who could skate, who could rush pucks, who could join rushes. um, And then also, be able to get back and defend, but it's starting to become a five man unit where it's not just D play D um, you'll see D lead rushes and, and being on the four check and um, create offense. Um, probably the biggest change that I've seen the last six years is the way people defend. Now um, you don't see a whole lot of skaters going backwards when they have numbers, they, they call it sweeping. So they'll come in, they'll deal skate forwards and they'll pressure um, off the wall where they have, you know, back pressure and their D partner will slide. So they'll, they'll do all these like little nuances. Like I said, if, if you don't know hockey, you may not catch. Um, but it's, it's not your traditional skate backwards, let them shoot transition. Like the whole, you know, we teach the whole point of playing defense is how fast can you get the puck to play off? And so like, can you shut it down at the blue line or do you have to get back in your zone to shut it down? Like it, just these little like things of that nature. So. Yeah, thanks for that. And then um, last last question here for you before we let you go. What, if anything, you could help, um, like give a tip to or just somebody who's up and coming playing hockey or knows someone who's involved in the game of hockey, what are those, um, if there's any tips to basically – make it to that division one level or just even get the chance to even coaching to move on to that, that next level and get those experience. What do you think really helped to get you to that point? Yeah. I'm, I'm actually glad you asked this because I was kind of thinking about this yesterday and even during the interview is, is the uh, there's, there's two things that for me that stand out and it's one, it's the time you put away from um, when you're not on the ice. I think that's the biggest thing. When I look back at, Um, kind of my experience and, you know, what led to my success is the countless amount of hours that I put in, like people don't realize that if I would spend, come home after practice when I would be like eight to eight to 18, right. Even up to that point, I would shoot pucks. I would stick handle. I would do some type of maybe exercise or I run three miles every night. Like I, my cardio was a big thing for me, but like any skill development, anything along those lines. I would do it for three hours a night though. At least I, you know, I couldn't tell you how many pucks I shot. It, it was well over 10,000 a summer. I'll guarantee you that. So, I mean, the blisters and the work that goes beyond these scenes is, is instrumental because um, if you're not doing it, someone else is. I mean, I guarantee you that there's a kid in Minnesota that's putting in the time and the effort um, because they have that drive and the will. The other thing is, um, um, you know, you're starting to see a lot of this trending now is more toward the family advisors and paying for that advice. Um, you know, when I work with team Wisconsin kids, I, I ask them like, Hey, if you have advisors, let me know who they are. And I try to figure out their structure. I don't really like kids paying for it. Um, you know, they're paying three to 5,000 a year for advice that may be good, may not be good. I mean, these, if you're a real agent, they, they offer it for free because they see some sort of potential, potential. Yep. and down the road, they get, you know, reciprocated from it. But if you're doing it right now, you could spend that money on your self development. go spend on a power skating coach. Like that's the biggest thing is edge work, power skating. Like if you can't skate, you can't play. So go spend it on your development versus someone else promoting you. when you could easily send out an email, a letter, a highlight DVD, like you can do that. So, and it doesn't cost very much. Um, those are the, the, probably the two biggest things for me. And then, uh, real quick, who do you think is going to win the Stanley cup this year? Oh man. 
I'm a Blackhawks guy, so it's not their year. I know that. Um, I don't know. Who do you guys like? I have an answer, but I kind of want to see if I'm stepping on any toes here. Obviously, I'd love to say my Flyers, but they're they're they put themselves in a hole right now. So I don't even know if they're going to make it. Toronto. Um, that's honestly who I think. If they can get out of round one, which has been their downfall the last yep. however many years, with Jack Campbell, especially on his ten game heater that he's on right now, like they just look like a new, juvenated, energized young team that Babcock did put together. He's not there anymore. He fucked that guy is right. He's not there anymore, which is good. But the team that he built is kind of still there, that young squad. And I'm yeah, I don't see anybody putting them. I mean, Tampa looks good too again. Yeah, I would Um, say I mean there's I would say a handful. I think it's hard because there's so much parity for the top teams like Colorado and Vegas coming out of the West. Like I, I do like them. Um, Toronto. I do really like my, I mean, probably out of the Easter Eastern division only. I mean, you look at Washington Islanders, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh is going to be good. And obviously when they get everyone back, my dark horse. Oh, Panthers. sorry. No, Panthers. You're good. Panthers. Panthers. My dark horse. I mean, they losing Ekblad hurts them um, a True. lot. True. Do you think at the at the trade deadline Monday, I uh, think they're going to bring, try to bring in another defenseman to fill to fill that huge hole because he was off to his best year that he's ever had so far this year. Yeah, he was uh, probably in top Norris candidate, to be honest. I uh, love watching him. Um, I'm pretty sure Florida just made a move today. They freed up some cap space. They traded uh, – Ah, uh, shit. Someone to the Blackhawks. I forget his name, uh, but they freed up a bunch of cap space. So I think they're going to make a move for um, at least a guy who can, if not two guys who can eat some minutes. So that's my guess. But yeah, I, I'm going to go with Colorado as my top team. Florida is my dark horse. So yeah, Colorado is unbelievable. Nathan McKinnon is so good. That team is so young too. Who's your favorite player in the NHL? Didn't even ask you this. Who's Who's your favorite player? First off, growing up as a kid, who did you type of want to shape your game after and type and like watched everybody who's played hockey has kind of done that where they've seen a guy on TV and it's like, okay, I want to kind of play like that he does in some sort of way. Yeah, it's it's definitely changed over the years. So when I was younger, I loved Eric Lindros, which I played D, so it makes zero sense. Um, but I loved Eric Lindros and then um you got to know Scott Gomez. He was a family friend from Anchorage um, with my cousins living up there. So followed them. And um, that kind of led me maybe towards the D style with Scott Stevens and then really started learning more. And it was Lidstrom throughout Um, just like your, like Mr. Like perfect. Right. So like played the game the right way, finesse, you know, it was tough at times, but you know, could shut down your top line, run your top power play. Um, and then as the game started to trend, I'd say Drew Doughty. Um, now I look at more of the offensive side of things. I still love like the Crosby Ovechkin, like those guys. And now it's starting to trend towards like, now my guys are McDavid and McKinnon. So it's, it, it evolves. Um, but I'm starting to phase out and be more on the offensive side of things. So, yeah, just like you mentioned with, um, kind of what you teach with the defensemen, with the guys that you work with, with shutting the puck down at the blue line. Tur- is, how fast can we go from defense to offense? Because the game is one playing offense and scoring goals. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the defensive end wins you the championships by limiting that, but the offense obviously drives that. It's really cool to see the NHL, like you mentioned, about 2015 roughly is where the, it whole, it all kind of switched when they – the no fighting. Are we going to take this out of the game? Now you're seeing a whole league full of 20, 20 to 25 year old kids who are buzzing around out there. And are, it's, it's just incredible to watch. Like there's so many young kids who could potentially be superstars at this point as all of the older guys kind of like fell off. Like Pavelski's still hanging on. Like you still have a handful of guys that, can still score and still produce that's why they're still there 
but as far as like the skating of it, they're the only reason they're still there is because they can score goals. Like everybody can move now. Yeah, you're starting to see like the passing of the torch. So I was uh, I was listening to ESPN this morning. They were they were even talking about it in golf, right? So you're starting to see like like you talked about. There's more speed, the skill of these kids, and and the confidence too is the big thing. Um, and you're starting to see, yeah, your older guys are still there. They're still producing. They're still doing their things. And so they're more focused on the defensive style, like, right. Like the older, like I talked about that kind of that shift in the momentum of style of play. Um, but yeah, it's all about speed now and, and how fast can you transition and score goals? And, um, it's exciting to watch, but yeah, I mean, you look at golf and they were talking about there's like Morikawa, uh, this Shifley, uh, there's like four other guys and they're like, you know, these guys come in and they're already way, way more skilled than we were at 20 or 22. They play with confidence. They attack pins. Like it's, it's kind of the same trend in, in that sense. So, um, yeah. And, and they have personalities too. It's just, it's different. So, um, hockey has been more always tight lipped and you don't really get to build your brand, but you're starting to see, um, you know, maybe the NBA and NFL rub off and being able to build your brand and your style and maybe having a little bit more of a, I don't know, a, a conversation and a, I don't know, any type of just area where you're different than what it used to be that, that mold. So, yeah. All right. We're going to wrap it up here. Two, two questions here off topic golf. We're going to go with golf here since we got the masters upon us, since I know you love golf Who's going to win the Masters? Well, I told you guys I sprinkled some bets on some guys before this. Um, I would love to see DJ repeat. I don't think he will. I think you're going to see just with like the course conditions and how they're playing right now. Um, they're super fast and dried out. So you're going to need someone with accuracy um, who can control distances and be a good putter. Um, God, I'm going to go dark horse and say Webb Simpson. Um, I, I just kind of like the way that his game's kind of been evolving um, recently and kind of trending for this. He's done traditionally well at the course, just hasn't had an opportunity to break through yet. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the leaderboard right now, too, and just kind of seeing where my guys are on bets. So S Simpson's tied for third as we speak. Um, you know, I... I, I'd say one of the younger guys, maybe Morikaya too, would have a, a decent shot. So those, those would be my two picks. Sounds good. And then last question, just a yes or no answer. Do you think Tiger makes a comeback yes. and, and don't catches even, Jack? Don't even finish it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I hope he does. Yes. All right. I'm glad to hear that. I think the whole entire world would like to see that as well happen, but Thank you so much for your time, man. Uh, it was great to have you on. Um, appreciate it. Appreciate it a lot. Yeah, no, thank you guys. Uh, like I said, uh, I was looking forward to this. I, I really don't get to talk a lot of hockey, so I apologize if my answers were long-winded or whatever. But, um, yeah, thank you guys. I, I enjoyed it and uh, wish you guys the best of luck with this. Thank you, and uh, have a great rest of your day, man. All right, thanks you guys too.